Ooh, that F1 race. Sure was some garbage racing this weekend, eh, Regan? What? You wanted me to talk about Long Beach? Okay, all right, all right, all right. Rossi dominance. Holy smokes. Uh, we haven't seen this kind of dominance uh, for quite a while. Uh, some people have been talking about Watkins Glen last year, and once again, man, oh man. I don't know how you stop Alexander Rossi when he's on it. Honestly, he's been on it this entire season. I'm starting to feel like I had a bit of a cold take, or at least a misguided one, uh, when talking about the guy who's been the star of this season, which uh, I and a lot of other people have been heaping that praise onto Robert Wickens. But if you look at the first three races of the season, there's only one man who could have won all of them, and that's Alexander Rossi. You look at St. Petersburg, and he was one mistake away from winning that race. I think if he'd waited a lap to make that move, he probably would have won the race. You go to Phoenix, makes a mistake in the pits, hits a crew member, then proceeds to drive around the field twice. Had he been on the lead lap, he would have won the Phoenix race by two laps. Then you get here to Long Beach, and he absolutely puts together a mistake-free weekend, and you see the results of it. Absolute dominance, beatdown. I don't know what else you can talk about. Uh, Alexander Rossi uh, has launched himself into that kind of elite group of folks where you just look at him, and for this year especially, it looks like not only is he maybe the best driver in the field, uh, but... It may He may run away with the championship at this point. If he keeps this up, if he minimizes the mistakes that we've seen in the last two races, I don't see why he doesn't have this championship wrapped up by at least Gateway. So let's get into the race. As expected, it was Alexander Rossi pulling away on the start, but it gets a little argy-bargy in the back of the field, or at least the back of the group that actually got off the hairpin before the green flag was thrown, as Graham Rahal absolutely punted Simon Pagano out of the race at turn one. Now, Graham Rahal received a penalty for this, which um, was the right call, in my opinion. I actually said on Twitter I didn't think they would give him one, seeing as race control has been 50-50 at best on punterinos, to use a Jimmy Broadbent uh, word, uh, on street circuits. It's been pretty inconsistent, but at least on this one, I think they made the right call. Graham was definitely in the wrong, uh, but Ray Hall was would eventually uh, drive all the way back up to through the field uh, and uh, get a pretty good finish out of it. So we get another restart, and once again, Alexander Rossi absolutely gaps the field, pulls the lead out to about three and a half seconds, um, and then throughout the race, despite the fact that Rossi was leading, we had some quite interesting variants and strategies. Uh, we saw uh, drivers and teams go on two versus three stop strategies, um, which I found was pretty interesting. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, uh, the three stop guys, the people who are straggling off the back of the three stop, uh, we're starting to get into the leader's way, and by that I mean Rossi. I think this may have been a bit of a combination of fuel saving on the uh, two-stop driver's uh, part and also the fact that the tire uh, compounds were fresher for those guys on the three-stop. Uh, but it looked like it was going to be another one of those races, kind of like Phoenix, where it was very, very difficult to lap other drivers. There was an instance where it looked like Alexander Rossi had pulled off an easy uh, overtaking maneuver on Zachary Clayman and DeMello, and then DeMello drove right around him and then proceeded to just hold, maintain a gap uh, in front of Rossi for the rest of uh, the stint. And then the bad luck saga for Robert Wickens continues. Unfortunately, once again, taken out of a good finish, this time by a mechanical issue, a gearbox on his car. It's kind of unfortunate because Wickens had been running a solid top five. He looked like he was challenging guys like Bourdais and Hinchcliffe early on in the race, but... Uh, them's the break sometimes, and it looks like uh, Wickens has just gotten the bad luck despite really driving uh, above his pay grade as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then we had the Kyle Kaiser incident, uh, and it's a bit disappointing because uh, Renee Binder is not driving the car, so I can't say Renee Bindit. Uh, Kaiser Bindit just doesn't quite have that same special spicy memory to it, uh, but that set up.
a uh, fairly interesting restart, and it kind of unfounded a lot of my uh, uh, lap car concerns uh, because on the restart, Alexander Rossi was able to maintain uh, his lap car advantage. There were about three or four lap cars in between him and uh, the second place driver who at that point was Scott Dixon and this is a point a major point I am going to bring up right now and of course I have video evidence to support my claim this is why you never wave the lap cars around not only did Alexander Rossi earn that advantage that he had when the yellow flag came out by lapping those cars that Scott Dixon and Sebastian Bourdais were unable to. But when we got to the restart, we literally got the greatest pass of all time when Sebastian Bourdais decided to go for a three-for-one deal at Kmart, and it actually paid off an unbelievable pass with a double draft off of Spencer Piggott and uh, uh, Scott Dixon, and then sliced to the inside of Mateus Laced, uh, and somehow actually made the corner. Absolutely unbelievable move, and then race control took it away. Ah. <laughs> uh, of all the times, of all of the times, you could have let a little something slide. You let Rossi slide at St. Petersburg. You let him slide. But you couldn't let two wheels in the pit lane slide for Bourdais. Ah, oh, man. And it's kind of sad, too, because ultimately it kind of ruined what I thought was going to be a really great duel between Rossi and Bourdais. Bourdais looked like the only driver who really had a shot to be able to uh, chase down and catch and possibly pass Rossi, but we'll never know because race control told uh, Bourdais that he had to slow down and give the position back to Dixon, uh, which promptly uh, he went right back in the next corner and took it back, which again kind of makes me question why there was a penalty in the first place. As far as I'm concerned, yes, generally I'm a stickler for the rules, but I think Bourdais was faster than Dixon anyway. If he was going to get around him one way or the other, why not keep the TV highlight? I mean, it, it seems like the pit lane every year, or the pit lane exit at Long Beach every year is an issue. So my question is, if it's really that big of an issue, why make it a transponder or a painted line issue? And why not put uh, a wall there all the way down to the pit lane exit? Or even possibly, I saw this suggested on Twitter, put a curb there. Uh, because if, if you really want to make it a black and white issue, make it so that it's a non-issue. That you just literally can't drive out there unless you're driving out uh, from the pit lane. Now obviously there may be some safety concerns putting a curb or a wall there. Um, but to me, it seems like it's more trouble than it's worth to call somebody on a penalty or even like in qualifying calling Ryan Hunter Ray uh, for crossing over the orange line too uh, early. It's, it's just a bit, it's a bit ticky tack. And, and to be honest with you, again, it, and he, it wasn't like he just drove out into the pit lane uh, blatantly. I didn't think it was a blatant. And when he realized he was out there, he definitely, you know, that's why he got that move with, uh, with Mateus laced, you know, he cut right back across to get back onto the racing surface. It wasn't like there was a car coming out of the pit lane. I don't think he endangered anybody. Um, it was a calculated move from a driver who is, you know, I, I have to say as well, you know, again, we're heaping praise on Rossi and Wickens. Bourdais driving better than I've ever seen him drive. I mean, this is unbelievable. I mean, and he's a guy who's won, you know, previously won four championships. He looked like last year uh, he was driving very, very well. This year he's driving better than that. So uh, it's amazing to see the renaissance of Sebastian Bourdais as well, especially considering after his um, fallout with the Toro Rosso F1 team, a lot of people ri had written him off as. Uh, not as talented, or maybe, oh, well, he was in the champ car field, you know, it was a weak field guy, if he wasn't that good. Uh, he's proven a lot of people wrong, I think, and it's fantastic. I, I you know, it's hard not to root for that team uh, with all of the, with Dale Coyne Racing, with Jimmy Vassar and Sully Sullivan, who lost their opportunity to be an IndyCar last year when KV folded. Uh, just a, so many good stories in that team. Um, and again, it's just kind of unfortunate because later in the race, uh, Bourdais kind of got screwed. 
And there was nothing like getting screwed by a teammate because it was Zachary Clayman and DeMello who lost it uh, coming off of the back straightaway and into the wall. Not something that was particularly surprising. That's not a slam on Clayman DeMello. If you'd watched the, uh, the IMSA race, a lot of drivers had gotten out you know, a, away from the, the groove, I guess you could say. It's kind of weird to talk about a groove on a street circuit, but over there in the drift section of the course, it really was a one-groove racetrack. And if you get out there uh, in the marbles, you're going into the wall, and that's exactly what we saw with Zachary Clay and DeMello. Uh, but the real controversy of the situation was the fact that they closed the pits. Okay. <laughs> you can maybe be able to tell I'm a bit triggered by this. They should never close the pits unless something like this is happening. So unless, unless you've got a car upside down and on fire in the pit lane entrance, you should never ever close the pits. And I'll tell you what, this is something that's really annoying to me because IndyCar actually got rid of the closing the pits rule in the DW12 era, and for some reason they went back to closing the pits. Why? They uh, they screwed uh, Bordet and Scott Dixon out of potentially really good finishes simply because they were able to anticipate uh, a yellow flag coming out. They came down the pits at just the wrong time when the light comes on. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the F1 race in China this, this weekend... Uh, you can see the benefit of not closing the pits because, hey, guess what? Red Bull was able to get into the pits, get some new tires when, hey, you know what? Mercedes and Ferrari got screwed. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I'd rather them get screwed on track than get screwed because, oh, well, you came into a closed pit. And I can't even understand exactly why they closed the pits in the first place. If it's not a safety issue, obviously, if it's a safety issue, then there's it's a no-brainer. But that crash was well away from you know any kind of safety equipment that would be coming out onto the racing surface or even down the pit lane. So and so, is it an entertainment thing? Uh, I have a hard time believing that because, in my opinion, it would be much more entertaining if uh, Sebastian Bourdais and, and Scott Dixon were able to come into the pits under the yellow, come out, possibly ahead of Rossi, and then have Rossi have to battle both of them for the win. So the only thing I've kind of thought about this is, is to ask why there is a closed pit rule in the first place. It's got to be TV. Um, I think the TV people like it when there's 25, 30 cars coming into the pits. And obviously that's an exaggeration because there's only 24 cars in this year's uh, Long Beach race. But I, I, I guess they just, you know, maybe it gives them the TV an opportunity to go to commercial immediately after a crash happens. And then the TV gets the, the everybody coming into the pits and there's pit stops and all. We, but you know what? Honestly, Especially after Phoenix and after some of the pit lane accidents we've seen, I think yellow flag pit stops really need a hard look um, in terms of safety. Because I think, uh, and especially also, you know, if we want to talk more F1, you look at what happened uh, in the Bahrain Grand Prix to the Ferrari mechanic. Um, green flag pit stops are the most dangerous, or not green flag pit stops, but the pit stops where everybody is coming into the pits at the same time are is the most dangerous uh, thing in IndyCar racing right now, as far as I'm concerned. You've got a lot of exposed bodies down there, and when you, the more cars you send down the pit lane, the more dangerous it becomes, and especially because when you're putting all those cars in that situation, it becomes a race off pit road. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more very serious accidents. I'm fully aware that these people are professionals, but sometimes as race control, you have to protect the folks uh, in the competition from themselves. And in my opinion, uh, closing the pits just amplifies the issues in pit lane, the potential for accidents and crew members getting involved in accidents. I think it's silly. I don't think you should ever close the pits unless it's a safety issue because, frankly, closing the pits creates more of a safety issue, in my opinion, uh, than not closing the pits at all because then you've got a more even spread of cars coming into the pits. You don't have the drag race situation where you know teams are trying to go faster than one another. Mistakes get made. Wheels fall off like we saw it at uh, Phoenix with Mateus Lace. All that stuff gets 
amp amplified uh, when you've got more and more cars in the pits. So the final yellow of the day was brought out and it was uh, not a good situation for Sebastian Bourdais, but I'll tell you what it was a good situation for. Uh, the freaking nose cam of that was just about as good a TV as you could have gotten. It almost felt like Bourdais had spun out on his own coming out of the hairpin, but then you realize that he'd been hit. Um, just really, really good TV coverage, uh, but it was Jordan King getting a little bit ambitious in the hairpin, diving up the inside, um, and th this actually created some Twitter drama between Bourdais and King. Um, I, if those tweets haven't been deleted, uh, maybe go look those up because it's kind of funny uh, to see the Twitter drama uh, after a race, but yeah, uh, definitely Jordan King's fault. Um, we were very lucky that that actually didn't uh, lead to a red flag. There have been some uh, opportunities in the past where uh, people have gotten piled up at the hairpin and they've had to red flag the race because there's literally so many cars down there that nobody can get through. Um, but this set up the final restart of the race, which uh, Alexander Rossi, uh, again, got an amazing launch. Uh, Willpower after the race actually had mentioned something about the Hondas having a bit more torque off of the corners, able to get the power down earlier and shoot off down the main straightaway. That's something fairly interesting uh, and an interesting observation from Will Power. Uh, but Power actually started chasing down Rossi a little bit, uh, but he used a lot of push to pass um, and was really not able to quite get to Rossi. Rossi really managed the end of the race very well and took his first Long Beach Grand Prix victory. Uh, so once again, I said it at the beginning of the video, I'll say it again here, man, Alexander Rossi absolutely on it this weekend. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of exciting uh, in a sense of uh, it's fun to have an American driver who, you know, didn't necessarily have the best luck in Europe. He did get to F1, so that's a nice thing. Um, I remember a Road and Track uh, magazine, and I think I believe I have it somewhere. I'll have to find it sometime. But uh, uh, they had a big cover story that claimed Alexander Rossi was the next Mario. And I think this was like 2012. And I kind of looked at it and I laughed back then. I was like, come on, you're overhyping him. Turns out Road and Track really wasn't overhyping Alexander Rossi. He looks like not only the real deal, but he looks like kind of the next uh, truly great American driver, which is kind of spectacular because we have two of them right now in Joseph Newgarden as well. There's a lot of positivity with IndyCar, and you've got right now the, kind of the things that it's needed for a while, which are two American drivers that don't have that last name. Uh, it's kind of nice to be able to form new names and new exciting drivers. Sometimes, you know, it's, I think, you know, the Andrettis, the Ray Halls, the Fittipaldis, they do sell, you know, they sell tickets, they get people in, they get people excited. Certainly, I was excited uh, at Phoenix when we had Ray Hall, Andretti, and uh, Fittipaldi all in there. But at the same time, it's nice to have Rossies, it's nice to have new gardens, new faces of the sport. Um, that's a good thing for the sport uh, going down the line because it kind of cuts down on the nepotism a little bit, makes it a more legitimate competition, uh, and it looks, you know, from the outside like the real talent is actually being seen, being found, and being brought to the front. So, again, a lot of positivity uh, heading into Barber. So speaking of Barber, a few news notes uh, kind of issues I'd like to discuss. First, a couple of things about Long Beach. Number one, uh, this is going to be a controversial opinion, I suspect, but because of the fact that J.R. Hildebrand announced his Indy 500 ride this weekend, or this week, I should say, not this weekend, I have to make a bit of an observation that I think Spencer Piggott's uh, underperforming a little bit. I'm starting to question whether or not Ed Carpenter made the right choice uh, for the full-time driver of that car. Now, I know a lot of people are Hildebrand haters. A lot of people don't believe in Hildebrand. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, he had one year, and it wasn't even a complete year because he broke his hand one year ago at this race on the last lap. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Piggott has not been on the pace. He's not been near the front. Uh, and when you look at a guy like Jordan King who's just come into the team, uh, and the competitiveness of him, 
I don't know. Uh, I don't know what Pickett's problem is. Um, I do know kind of as an observationalist, as someone who uh, observed him in Indy Lights, I was never the most impressed with Spencer Pickett, but there's a lot of people high on him. So I'm kind of confused as to exactly what this slump is all about. Is it just a sophomore slump? This is kind of, I guess you could call technically his second full season in IndyCar, um, despite the fact that he didn't do the ovals last year outside of Indianapolis. I don't know. It's tough. Um, I don't know what his problem is uh, or whether or not, you know, just the 21 car isn't very good this year. There's a lot of questions in regards to that. Uh, Another thing I wanted to talk about real quick is the NBC coverage. Um, I think they did a really solid job this weekend. I think they did a better job than they did in Phoenix, by the way. Uh, They definitely made a race which had a very dominant car. Uh, quite exciting, quite entertaining. Um, that's something a lot of other series seem to struggle with. A lot of other coverage teams seem to struggle with. Uh, just look at ABC. Imagine if ABC had covered this race, like I said, in Phoenix. Um, but I will say there are a couple critiques I have of, of NBC, at least early on. I think their pit reporting is a little bit off right now. I don't exactly know why that is. Maybe it's just rust. Um, but some of the pit reporting is kind of iffy at best. Uh, the pre-races or the pre-race show, I should say. Some of the segments are a bit cringy. Um, They did some things that I think were supposed to be funny with James Hinchcliffe and Robert Wickens, and then later with uh, Mateus Laced and Tony Kanaan, and they weren't really all that funny. Um, So, you know, if you're going to go that route with a pre-race, you've got to make sure it's funny because otherwise it just kind of lays flat, and it's like, uh... So I get, you know, trying to get personalities, but maybe try to introduce it a little bit better and by the way Paul Tracy when you're on the the grid maybe maybe don't be looking around look look at the camera Paul PT I, I love you PT but you got to look at the camera um and then we we move on to Barber next week um Barber's usually one of the better road races of the season at least in the DW12 era it's been fantastic particularly when the Arrow Kid era was there 2015 and 2016 were some of the best road course races IndyCar's put on in a very long time uh so it'll be interesting to see what the Universal Arrow Kid exactly how things go. Um, will we see a track record at Barber? I know Zach Veach had mentioned. By the way, Zach Veach, uh, fourth place. I didn't even give him a shout-out. That fantastic drive from Zach Veach. Also, uh, Ed Jones. Uh, good job to Ed Jones. He got a podium, made up uh, for a lot of the uh, lost ground he had at Phoenix. There's some people doubting whether or not uh, Ed Jones is going to be uh, in that seat next year already. I'd say wait till we get to Indianapolis on that one because I think Jones is going to be pretty fast there. Um, but yeah, Barber. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Rossi performs because if Rossi's good at Barber, you have to think he's going to be good at the Grand Prix of Indianapolis, which is, of course, another natural terrain road course. Then you go to the Indianapolis 500, and we know how strong Rossi was there last year. He was really the only guy that had anything for Alonso earlier in the race, um, and then he kind of got shuffled out in the pit sequence. Otherwise, I think Rossi probably would have uh, stormed away to another Indy 500 win. Um, so as long as Andretti Autosport has the setup with the new Aero Kit, I'm still doubting them a little bit because the last time we had bumping, by the way, we've got bumping this year, uh, confirmed 100% now. Um, it looks like, you know, some, you know, in 2011, they struggled with the bumping. They struggled with the setup. They had a lot of trouble getting their cars in the field. So it's not outside the realm of possibility that Andretti could have troubles in qualifying, but they've got a really good handle on this DW12 chassis. They have since 2012, all the way up until this point. I don't see that changing with a body kit, but stranger things have happened. So thank you guys so much for watching the IndyCar Red Pill. Let me know your comments, your thoughts on this race, Alexander Rossi and a few other drivers. If I missed anything, come down here and let me know. Let's get the discussion going. Uh, We got a pretty busy week coming up. Of course, Barber's next week, so uh, this uh, train just uh, keeps it rolling, and we're getting very, very close to the month of May. Indy 500 month on this channel. You guys, I know, are going to want to check out all the content I've got coming because it's it's a lot of content. I'm just telling you right now. So thank you guys so much for watching. This has been David Land on YouTube, and we'll see you in the next video.